Form of Administering the Sacraments by John Calvin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Form of Administering Baptism. It is particularly necessary to know that infants are to be brought for baptism either on the Lord's Day at the time of catechizing or at public service on other days, that as baptism is a kind of formal adoption into the church, so it may be performed in the presence and under the eyes of the whole congregation. Answer, we do indeed. Minister, our Lord demonstrates in what poverty and wretchedness we are all born by telling us that we must be born again. For if our nature requires to be renewed in order to gain admission to the kingdom of God, it is a sign that it is altogether perverted and cursed. By this, then, he admonishes us to humble ourselves and be displeasing to ourselves, and in this way he disposes us to desire and seek for his grace, by which all the perverseness and malediction of our first nature may be abolished. For we are not capable of receiving grace unless we be first divested of all trust in our own virtue, wisdom, and righteousness, so as to condemn everything we possess. But when he has demonstrated our wretchedness, he in like manner consoles us by his mercy, promising to regenerate us by his Holy Spirit to a new life, which forms a kind of entrance into his kingdom. This regeneration consists of two parts. First, we renounce ourselves, not following our own reason, our own pleasure and our own will, but bringing our understanding and our heart into captivity to the wisdom and justice of God. We mortify everything belonging to us and to our flesh. And secondly, we thereafter follow the light of God, seeking to be agreeable to him and obey his good pleasure as he manifests it by his word and conducts us to it by his Holy Spirit. The accomplishment of both of these is in our Lord Jesus Christ, whose death and passion have such virtue that, in participating in it, we are, as it were, buried to sin, in order that our carnal lusts may be mortified. In like manner, by virtue of his resurrection, we rise again to a new life which is of God, inasmuch as his Spirit conducts and governs us to produce in us works which are agreeable to him. However, the first and principal point of our salvation is that by his mercy he forgives us all our offences, not imputing them to us, but effacing the remembrance of them, that they may no longer come against us in judgment. All these graces are bestowed upon us when he is pleased to incorporate us into his church by baptism, for in this sacrament he attests the remission of our sins and he has ordained the symbol of water to figure to us, that is, by this element bodily defilements are cleansed, so he is pleased to wash and purify our souls. Moreover, he employs it to represent our renovation, which consists, as has been said, in the mortification of our flesh and in the spiritual life which it produces in us. Thus we receive a twofold grace and benefit from our God in baptism, provided we do not annihilate the virtue of the sacrament by our ingratitude. We have in it sure evidence, first, that God is willing to be propitious to us, not imputing to us our faults and offences, and secondly, that he will assist us by his Holy Spirit, in order that we may be able to war against the devil, sin, and the lusts of our flesh, and gain the victory over them so as to live in the liberty of his kingdom, which is the kingdom of righteousness. Seeing then that these two things are accomplished in us by the grace of Jesus Christ, it follows that the virtue and substance of baptism is included in him. And in fact we have no other lava than his blood, and no other renovation than his death and resurrection. But as he communicates his riches and blessings to us by his word, so he distributes them to us by his sacraments. Now, our gracious God, not contenting himself with having adopted us for his children and received us into the communion of his church, has been pleased to extend his goodness still farther to us by promising to be our God and the God of our seed to a thousand generations. Hence, though the children of believers are of the corrupt race of Adam, he nevertheless accepts them in virtue of this covenant and adopts them into his family. For this reason, he was pleased from the first Genesis 17.12, that in his church children should receive the sign of circumcision, by which he then represented all that is now signified to us by baptism. And as he gave commandment that they should be circumcised, so he adopted them for his children and called himself their God, as well as the God of their fathers. 
Now then, since the Lord Jesus Christ came down to earth, not to diminish the grace of God his Father, but to extend the covenant of salvation over all the world, instead of confining it as formerly to the Jews, there is no doubt that our children are heirs of the life which he has promised to us. And hence St. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 7.14, that God sanctifies them from their mother's womb to distinguish them from the children of pagans and unbelievers. For this reason, our Lord Jesus Christ received the children that were brought to him, as is written in the 19th chapter of St. Matthew, then were brought unto him little children, that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them, and Jesus said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. By declaring that the kingdom of heaven belongs to them, laying hands on them and recommending them to God his Father, he clearly teaches that we must not exclude them from his church. Following this rule, then, we will receive this child into his church, in order that it may become a partaker of the blessings which God has promised to all believers. And first we will present it to him in prayer, all saying with the heart humbly, O Lord God, eternal and omnipotent Father, since it hath pleased thee of thy infinite mercy to promise us that thou wilt be our God and the God of our children, we pray that it may please thee to confirm this grace in the child before thee, born of parents whom thou hast called into thy church, and as it is offered and consecrated to thee by us, do thou deign to receive it under thy holy protection, declaring thyself to be its God and Saviour, by forgiving it the original sin of which all the race of Adam are guilty, and thereafter sanctifying it by thy Spirit, in order that when it shall arrive at the years of discretion, it may recognize and adore thee as its only God, glorifying thee during its whole life, so as always to obtain of thee the forgiveness of its sins. And in order to its obtaining such graces, be pleased to incorporate it into the communion of our Lord Jesus Christ, that it may partake of all his blessings as one of the members of his body. Hear us, O merciful Father, in order that the baptism which we communicate to it according to thy ordinance may produce its fruit and virtue, as declared to us by the Gospel. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the object is to receive this child into the fellowship of the Christian church, you promise, when it shall come to the years of discretion, to instruct it in the doctrine which is received by the people of God, as it is summarily comprehended in the confession of faith, which we all have, viz. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You promise then to be careful to instruct it in all this doctrine, and generally in all that is contained in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, in order that it may receive them as the sure word of God coming from heaven. Likewise, you will exhort it to live according to the rule which our Lord has laid down in his law, which is contained summarily in two points, to love God with all our heart and mind and strength, and our neighbour as ourselves. In like manner, to live according to the admonitions which God has given by his prophets and apostles, in order that, renouncing itself and its own lusts, it may dedicate and consecrate itself to glory the name of God and Jesus Christ, and edify its neighbour. After the promise made, the name is given to the child, and the minister baptizes it, saying, Name, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The whole is said aloud, and in the common tongue, in order that the people who are present may be witnesses to what is done, for which purpose it is necessary that they understand it, and in order that all may be edified by recognizing and calling to mind the fruit and use of their own baptism. We know that elsewhere there are many other ceremonies which we deny not to be very ancient, but because they have been invented at pleasure, or at least on grounds which, be these what they may, must be trivial, 
since they have been devised without authority from the word of God, and because, on the other hand, so many superstitions have sprung from them, we have felt no hesitation in abolishing them, in order that there might be nothing to prevent the people from going directly to Jesus Christ. First, whatever is not commanded, we are not free to choose. Secondly, nothing which does not tend to edification ought to be received into the church. If anything of the kind has been introduced, it ought to be taken away, and by much stronger reason, whatever serves only to cause scandal, and is, as it were, an instrument of idolatry and false opinion, ought on no account to be tolerated. Now, it is certain that chrism, tapers, and other pomposities are not of the ordination of God, but have been added by men, and have at length gone so far that people have dwelt more on them and held them in higher estimation than the proper institution of Jesus Christ. At all events, we have a form of baptism such as Jesus Christ instituted, the apostles kept and followed, and the church put in practice, and there is nothing for which we can be blamed unless it be for not being wiser than God himself the manner of celebrating the Lord's Supper. It is proper to observe that the Sunday before the Supper is dispensed, it is intimated to the people first in order that each may prepare and dispose himself to receive it worthily and with becoming reverence. Secondly, that young people may not be brought forward unless they are well instructed and have made a profession of their faith in the church. Thirdly, in order that if there are strangers who are still rude and ignorant, they may come and present themselves for instruction in private. On the day of communion, the minister adverts to it at the end of his sermon, or indeed, if he sees cause, make it the sole subject of the sermon in order to expound to the people what our Lord means to teach and signify by this ordinance, and in what way it behoves us to receive it. After prayer and the confession of faith, to testify in the name of the people that all wish to live and die in the doctrine of Christ, he says aloud, let us listen to the institution of the Holy Supper by Jesus Christ, as narrated by St. Paul in the 11th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We have heard, brethren, how our Lord makes his supper among his disciples, and thereby shows us that strangers, in other words those who are not of the company of the faithful, ought not to be admitted. Wherefore, in accordance with this rule, in the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I excommunicate all idolaters, blasphemers, despisers of God, heretics, and all who form sects apart to break the unity of the church, all perjurers, all who are rebellious to parents and to their superiors, all who are seditious, mutinous, quarrelsome, injurious, all adulterers, fornicators, thieves, misers, ravishers, drunkards, gluttons, and all who lead a scandalous life, declaring to them that they must abstain from this holy table, for fear of polluting and contaminating the sacred viands which our Lord Jesus Christ gives only to his household and believers. Therefore, according to the exhortation of St. Paul, let each prove and examine his conscience to see whether he has truly repented of his faults and is dissatisfied with himself, desiring to live henceforth holily and according to God, above all whether he puts his trust in the mercy of God and seeks his salvation entirely in Jesus Christ, and whether, renouncing all enmity and rancor, he truly intends and resolves to live in concord and brotherly charity with his neighbours. If we have this testimony in our hearts before God, let us have no doubt at all that he adopts us for his children, and that the Lord Jesus addresses his word to us to invite us to his table and present us with this holy sacrament which he communicated to his disciples. 
and although we feel within ourselves much frailty and misery from not having perfect faith, but being inclined to unbelief and distrust, as well as from not being devoted to the service of God so entirely, and without such zeal as we ought, and from having to war daily against the lusts of our flesh, nevertheless, since our Lord has graciously deigned to have his gospel imprinted on our hearts, in order to withstand all unbelief, and has given us this desire and affection to renounce our own desires, to follow righteousness and his holy commandments. Let us all be assured that the vices and imperfections which are in us will not prevent his receiving us, and making us worthy of taking part at this spiritual table. For we do not come to declare that we are perfect or righteous in ourselves, but on the contrary, by seeking our life in Christ, we confess that we are in death, let us understand that this sacrament is a medicine for the poor spiritual sick, and that all the worthiness which our Saviour requires in us is to know ourselves so as to be dissatisfied with our vices, and have all our pleasure, joy, and contentment in him alone. First, then, let us believe in these promises which Jesus Christ, who is infallible truth, has pronounced with his own lips, viz. that he is indeed willing to make us partakers of his own body and blood, in order that we may possess him entirely in such a manner that he may live in us and we in him. And although we see only bread and wine, yet let us not doubt that he accomplishes spiritually in our souls all that he shows us externally by these visible signs. In other words, that he is heavenly bread, to feed and nourish us unto life eternal. Next, let us not be ungrateful to the infinite goodness of our Saviour, who displays all his riches and blessings at this table, in order to dispense them to us. For in giving himself to us, he bears testimony to us that all which he has is ours. Moreover, let us receive this sacrament as a pledge that the virtue of his death and passion is imputed to us for righteousness, just as if we had suffered it in our own persons. Let us not be so perverse as to keep back when Jesus Christ invites us so gently by his word, but while reflecting on the dignity of the precious gift which he gives us, let us present ourselves to him with ardent zeal in order that he may make us capable of receiving him. With this view, let us raise our hearts and minds on high where Jesus Christ is, in the glory of his Father, and from whence we look for him at our redemption. And let us not amuse ourselves with these earthly and corruptible elements which we see with the eye and touch with the hand, in order to seek him there, as if he were enclosed in the bread or wine. Then only will our souls be disposed to be nourished and vivified with his substance, when they are thus raised above all terrestrial objects and carried as high as heaven to enter the kingdom of God where he dwells. Let us be contented then to have the bread and wine as signs and evidences, spiritually seeking the reality where the word of God promises that we shall find it. This done, the ministers distribute the bread and cup to the people, having warned them to come forward with reverence and in order. Meanwhile, some psalms are sung, or some passages of scripture read, suitable to what is signified by the sacrament. At the end, thanks are given, as has been said. We are well aware what occasion of scandal some have taken from the change made in this matter, because the mass has been long in such esteem that the poor people seem disposed to think that it was the principal part of Christianity, it has been thought very strange in us to have abolished it. And for this cause, those who are not duly informed think that we have destroyed the sacrament. But when they have well considered our practice, they will find that we have restored it to its integrity. Let them consider what conformity there is between the Mass and the institution of Jesus Christ. It is clear that there is just as much as there is between day and night. Although it is not our intention here to treat this subject at length, yet to satisfy those who through simplicity might be scandalized at us, it seemed advisable to touch upon it in passing. Seeing then that the sacrament of our Lord has been corrupted by the many adulterations and horrible abuses which have been introduced, we have been constrained to apply a remedy and change many things which had been improperly introduced, or at least turned to a bad use. Now, in order to do so, we have found no means better or more proper than to return to the pure institution of Jesus Christ, which we follow simply, as is apparent. Such is the reformation which St. Paul points out. 
form and manner of celebrating marriage. It is necessary to observe that in celebrating marriage it is published in the church on three Sundays, that anyone knowing of any hindrance may timelessly announce it, or any one having interest may oppose it. This done, the parties come forward at the commencement of the sermon when the minister says, Our help be in the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. God our Father, after creating heaven and earth, and all that therein is, created and formed man after his own image and likeness, to have dominion and lordship over the beasts of the earth, the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, saying, after he had created man, it is not good that the man be alone, let us make him a help meet for him. And our Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and while Adam slept, God took one of his ribs, and of it formed Eve, giving us to understand that the man and the woman are only one body, one flesh, and one blood. Wherefore, the man leaves father and mother and cleaves to his wife, whom he ought to love just as Jesus loves the church, or in other words, the true believers and Christians for whom he died. And likewise, the woman ought to serve and obey her husband in all holiness and honesty, for she is subject to and in the power of the husband, so long as she lives with him. And this holy marriage, ordained of God, is of such force that in virtue of it, the husband has not power over his body but the woman, nor the woman power over her body but the husband. Wherefore, being joined together of God, they can no more be separated except for a time by mutual consent to have leisure for fasting and prayer, taking good heed not to be tempted of Satan through incontinence. And they ought to return to each other, for in order to avoid fornication each one ought to have his wife and each woman her husband, so that all who have not the gift of continence are obliged by the command of God to marry, in order that the holy temple of God, in other words our bodies, be not violated and corrupted. For seeing that our bodies are members of Jesus Christ, it would be a gross outrage to make them the members of a harlot. Wherefore, we ought to preserve them in all holiness. For whoso pollutes the temple of God, him will God destroy. You then, name and name, naming the bridegroom and bride, knowing that God has so ordained it, do you wish to live in this holy state of marriage which God has so highly honoured? Have you such a purpose as you manifest here before his holy assembly, asking that it be approved? They answer, yes. The minister, I take you all, who are here present as witnesses, praying you to keep it in remembrance. However, if there is anyone who knows of any impediment, or that either of them is connected by marriage with another, let him say so. If nobody opposes, the minister says, since there is nobody who opposes, and there is no impediment, our Lord God confirms your holy purpose which he has given you, and let your commencement be in the name of God, who has made heaven and earth. Amen. The minister, addressing the bridegroom, says, Do you, name, confess here before God and his holy congregation that you have taken and take, name, here present for your wife and spouse, whom you promise to keep, loving and maintaining her faithfully, as is the duty of a true and faithful husband to his wife, living holily with her, observing faith and lealty to her in all things, according to the word of God and his holy gospel. Answer. Yes. Then, addressing the bride, he says, You, name, confess here before God and his holy assembly that you have taken and take, name, for your lawful husband, whom you promise to obey, serving and being subject to him, living holily, observing faith and lealty to him in all things, as a faithful and loyal spouse owes to her husband, according to the word of God and his holy gospel. Answer. Yes. Then the minister says, The Father of all mercy, who of his grace has called you to this holy state for the love of Jesus Christ his Son, who by his holy presence sanctified marriage, there performing his first miracle before the apostles, anoint you with his Holy Spirit to serve and honour him together with one common accord. Amen. Listen to the Gospel, how our Lord intends that holy marriage should be kept, and how firm and indissoluble it is, according as it is written in St. Matthew, at the 19th chapter. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? 
that which he made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Believe in these holy words which our Lord uttered, as the Gospel narrates them, and be assured that our Lord God has joined you in holy marriage. Wherefore, live holily together in good love, peace, and union, keeping true charity, faith, and loyalty to each other, according to the word of God. Let us all, with one heart, pray to our Father. God, Almighty, all good and all wise, who from the beginning didst foresee that it was not good for man to be alone, and therefore didst create him a helpmeet for him, and hast ordained that two should be one, we beg of thee and humbly request that since it has pleased thee to call these persons to the holy state of marriage, thou wouldst deign of thy grace and goodness to give and send them thy Holy Spirit, in order that they may live holily in true and firm faith according to thy good will, surmounting all bad affections, edifying each other in all honesty and chastity, giving thy blessing to them, as thou didst to thy faithful servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that having holy lineage they may praise and serve thee, teaching them and bringing them up to thy praise and glory and the good of their neighbor, through the advancement and exaltation of thy holy gospel. Hear us, Father of mercy, through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy very dear Son. Amen. Our Lord, fill you with all graces and anoint you with all good, to live together long and holily. Visitation of the Sick The office of a true and faithful minister is not only publicly to teach the people over whom he is ordained pastor, but so far as may be to admonish, exhort, rebuke, and console each one in particular. Now the greatest need which a man ever has of the spiritual doctrine of our Lord is when his hand visits him with afflictions, whether of disease or other evils, and specially at the hour of death, for then he feels more strongly than ever in his life before, pressed in conscience both by the judgment of God, to which he sees himself about to be called, and the assaults of the devil, who then uses all his efforts to beat down the poor person and plunge and overwhelm him in confusion. And therefore the duty of a minister is to visit the sick and console them by the word of the Lord, showing them that all which they suffer and endure comes from the hand of God and from his good providence, who sends nothing to believers except for their good and salvation. He will quote passages of scripture suitable to this view. Moreover, if he sees the sickness to be dangerous, he will give them consolation, which reaches farther, according as he sees them touched by their affliction. That is to say, if he sees them overwhelmed with the fear of death, he will show them that it is no cause of dismay to believers, who having Jesus Christ for their guide and protector, will by their affliction be conducted to the life on which he has entered. By similar considerations, he will remove the fear and terror which they may have of the judgment of God. If he does not see them sufficiently oppressed and agonized by a conviction of their sins, he will declare to them the justice of God, before which they cannot stand save through his mercy embracing Jesus Christ for their salvation. On the contrary, seeing them afflicted in their consciences and troubled for their offenses, he will exhibit Jesus Christ to the life and show how in him all poor sinners who, distrusting themselves, repose in his goodness, find solace and refuge. Moreover, a good and faithful minister will duly consider all means which it may be proper to take to console the distressed according as he sees them affected, being guided in the whole by the word of the Lord. Furthermore, if the minister has anything whereby he can console and give bodily relief to the afflicted poor, let him not spare but show to all a true example of charity. End of Form of Administering the Sacrament by John Calvin